Well, we will live by the technology and die by the technology and hope, hopefully all this works. I can't, it's going to be a little odd. I can't see the, the screen right here in front of me, so I'm going to be doing this to see what's up there so I can speak to it. Um, how many of you know a little tiny bit about archaeology? Maybe just a little. That's good. I'm always a little nervous about, about talking about archaeology uh, amongst evangelicals. I can talk about us because I are one. I think it's pretty safe to say that amongst evangelicals, I'm talking about just sort of generally, somewhere between 80 and 90 percent at least of what evangelicals think they know about archaeology in the Bible is either outdated, untrue, or an out-and-out hoax. I have never spoken at a conference where I wasn't accosted at the end and asked questions about, did you hear about this discovery? Did you see this on the internet? Did you hear about so-and-so? And it's almost all hoaxes. The problem with Christians is, bless our hearts, is we dig faith, right? I mean, faith sort of at the center of what we do. Now, Mark Twain defined faith as believing in something you know really isn't true. Now, there are a lot of people in the Christian world who really do hold sort of a Mark Twainian kind of faith. And I suppose there's nothing wrong with that as long as what you believe happens to be true. Then you luck out. But let me say this. All of the faith of all of the Christians who have ever lived on this planet can't make one word of the Bible true if it isn't true in reality to begin with. Now, I got out of the theological world about 30 years ago. You know, I went the whole nine yards and got the PhD and all that stuff. And I really got tired of arguing with my brothers about whether Calvinism was a mental disorder. (laughs) Which it just may be. Um, And I really became interested in the historical issues. And here's why. Because that book, how many of you have a Bible handy? Because I want you to look in the uninspired section in a moment. That would be the back part, you know, that index, okay. There are so many people in the world uh, within Christianity who have the wrong idea of the Bible. Most people look at the Bible as a, how many of you would say the Bible is a theological book? See, I'm baiting you now, you're hesitant. (laughs) Most people would say the Bible is principally a theological book or a book of spiritual truth, first and foremost. But I would tend to disagree with that. I think first and foremost, the Bible is a book of history. Because if the history isn't true, if the realities of the events and the world presented to us on the pages of the Bible didn't actually occur, then where in the world do we get off trying to believe and place our lives on the invisible stuff? If you can't trust the Bible for what you can see and test and dig up, then all of that other stuff, how would you put your trust in that? I don't think it'd be a smart bet to do it. Here's what we have. Let me sort of jump to the end, and then we're going to stuff the middle with some archaeology. 
Christians hold what they hold. We hold the belief that we hold on the basis of powerful, incontrovertible evidence. We believe because we are compelled to believe based on the evidence that we see. Why do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead? For the same reason that the apostles believed that Jesus rose from the dead. Why did they believe that? Because they kept bumping into the guy for about 40 days after he was crucified and buried and dead. And they bumped into him so often that eventually they got the idea, wow, he's really risen from the dead. But then some still doubted, and I suppose you're never going to get around that. But the fact of the matter is that we have a faith founded on fact. We do not hold a faith founded on faith. And I want to show you some of that tonight. I'm going to get, we're going to get real nuts and boltsy here. We're going to get down off the theological perch. We're going to get down in the dirt. I want to show you from the dirt firsthand why the Bible is historically authentic. I want to give you a grand demonstration. Now, what I've picked out to do is something that, well, just happens to be my area of expertise. Um, I guess if you study something like the location of Sodom and Gomorrah, as long as I have, I've been at it now uh, academically, intensively for 10 years now. Some people say that's a waste of life. But I've been at this long enough where I think I can safely say that I probably know more about this subject than anybody living or dead, except maybe Abraham and Lot. And uh, I'll probably join the ranks of that (laughs) before our dig is over. We just signed a new 10-year contract, a scientific contract with the Department of Antiquities, taking us through, uh, probably I'll be going onto the site with a walker by then. Um... But this is important stuff. It is the cutting edge of biblical archaeology right now. The Tal al-Hammam excavation project really is the only apologetically oriented, apologetically usable excavation going on in the world at this point, anywhere in the Middle East. And the reason I say that is, is because, frankly, they, you know, I have good friends uh, excavating at Megiddo and Gezer and Hatzor and all these other wonderful sites in Israel and, and in Jordan, But frankly, there isn't anybody in the world who doubts the existence of any of those cities. So if you find them and you dig them up, what do you prove? You haven't really proved anything. But 99.9% of scholars, even a lot of them in 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 the Christian world, in the biblical studies world, do not believe that Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain really existed. They're some sort of mythical geographical construct in some sort of a a moral tale. Okay. Myths spun by Judahite priests sitting around campfires, I suppose. But, in fact, um, just about, well, two years ago at an ASOR conference, ASOR, that's the American Schools of Oriental Research, that's where all of us go and present all of our stuff every year. Um, good friend of mine who I'll introduce. In fact, let's just see if this thing works. Oh, it does. I'm so excited. (laughs) Professor Bill Deaver, good friend of mine. I've had him in Albuquerque twice to speak, but he's always my nemesis. He's always dogging me, saying little things like this. And uh, just a couple of years ago, I was standing... uh, at, at Asor with a, with a sign over my head, Tal El Hammam slash Sodom. And he came up to me and he tugged on my coat sleeve and he says, that's as close as you'll ever get to Sodom. Why? Because he thinks it doesn't exist. It's simply a myth. In fact, the book of Genesis is the most criticized book in the Bible. There is no other book in the Bible that gets the bad press like Genesis. And the patriarchal narratives in the book of Genesis aren't even believed by 98% of the Israeli archaeologists. Isn't it amazing that archaeologists working in Israel, most of them don't believe that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua are real? They don't believe those people lived and, and those events, they, the events didn't happen as far as they're concerned. 
that always kind of is amazing. I mean, if you don't believe in Abraham, it kind of puts a chink in the whole argument for Israel's existence, but <laughs> they didn't think of that. But this, it's a fact. You, you would not believe, when you move over into the world of archaeology, you would not believe the skepticism and, in fact, the out-and-out uh, critical ven- venom that is spilled against the Bible. In fact, someone recently asked Herschel Shanks, the editor of Biblical Archaeology Review, anybody take that magazine? One of my students, my PhD students, asked one of the main editors at Barr, he said, why doesn't Herschel let Dr. Collins write an article on Sodom for BAR? He said, do you really want to know? He said, yeah. He said, it's because he thinks he uses the Bible too much. And I said, that's a real interesting statement coming from a guy who owns a magazine called Biblical Archaeology Review. People get really nervous when you use the Bible in archaeology. Now, it's kind of fun in Jordan, and we are digging in Jordan, in a Muslim country, because frankly, as, as Dr. Ziad, my good friend and the Director General of the Department of Antiquities in Jordan, he said to me just a few weeks ago, he said, you know, we Muslims and you Christians and the Jews all have one thing in common, at least one thing. I said, what is that? He said, Sodom. Yeah, I guess so. Every one of those religious traditions puts pretty heavy stock in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? Because it is pretty much our metaphor for the judgment of God against wickedness, right? And all of the religions use that. But the fact of the matter is, is that if I were trying to find Sodom in, say, had it actually been on the other side of the river, which the Bible says it's on, the east side of the river, not the west side. But had it been on the Israeli side of the river, guess what? I would be laughed off so many stages in the archaeological community. Why? Because they don't take the story seriously. People think we're wasting our time even looking for these cities because they don't exist. This is all myths and legends. However, in Jordan... Because the Quran mentions Sodom and Gomorrah, not by name, but the story of the fire out of the sky and so on, destroying the evil cities in the time of Abraham and Lot. The story's in the Quran 15 times, and they take it seriously. So it's interesting. In Israel, I can't talk about the time of Abraham, but in Jordan, I can talk about Abraham and the destruction of the cities, and where they are, and how they were destroyed, and and use the archaeological facts to back it up. In fact, in the first five years of our excavation, we just finished our sixth season of excavation just a few weeks ago. And this year was, a, was an amazing turnaround, and I don't even begin to have time to tell the story of what happened this, during this season. But in the first five years, we were, even though we were the largest and have been the largest archaeological excavation in Jordan for five years up to this year, uh, we've been operating in virtual obscurity. And the reason is because there's a lot of old guard archaeologists in Jordan who were German, higher critical trained, and uh, are frankly atheists, and don't like the idea of using the Bible, because if you use the Bible, you're a Zionist. You're a Zionist. Well, the new guard archaeologists, the new archaeologists coming up, three of whom have recently enrolled in Trinity Southwest University to learn Bible archaeology, Interesting. Um, the new and up-and-coming archaeologists aren't so nervous about it. In fact, they believe you ought to use any and all ancient texts, including the Bible, when doing archaeology, which is the only proper thing to do, actually. But this year, the world changed. For five years, it's been a really tough go, but this year, we got a new director general of the Department of Antiquities, and I got a phone call from him this last season. He said... I want to come down and I want to sit with you and I want you to tell me everything you know. I want to see all your evidence. I want to see everything about what, about what you think about Sodom. I want to see your biblical evidence, your textual evidence, everything. Came down to the hotel. We spent two days together at the end of our presentations and our discussion. Oh, he even said this. 
Now tell me about the destruction. What do you know? And we talked about that. And at the end of it all, he said, I want you to know, and he told our team, there's 30 of my staff. He said to us, I want you to know, you're now the most important archaeological excavation in Jordan, and this is perhaps the most important discovery in the history of archaeology. And I was pinching myself going, what planet did I just land on? This has never happened to us before. So we are in a new regime. God has opened some doors, and I can tell you some stories that are so amazing, but I don't have time. Ask me afterward. We'll stay in the parking lot till midnight and tell stories. All right, now, let's follow this theme, thing through. Why in the world do we get involved in this to begin with? Why is it important? Oh, by the way, here's my answer to Dr. Deaver. And the reason is, is because even Bill Deaver uses the Bible in his archaeology. He's always talking about he dug the Gezer, the Gezer Gate, which was built by King Solomon. That's his, kind of his claim to fame. Well, the only book that I know of in the ancient Near East that talks about King Solomon is the Bible. So Bill Deaver uses the Bible as well. So you can't get away from it. Now, let's talk about geography. This is going to be so much fun for you. Don't you love geography? All right, here you go. There are two kinds of people in the world. Those who love geography and those who hate it and know absolutely nothing about it and couldn't care less. Well, hopefully we can turn you into a, a geographer here in the next couple of minutes. It's important because... It's a perfect test case to test the credibility of the Bible. If Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, the cities of the plain, actually existed at a particular place at a particular time, we ought to be able to go to that place, dig in the ground, see if it matches the time frame stratigraphically, and determine whether the cities were actually destroyed at the right time or not. Now, when you do this kind of a test case, it also opens up the possibility that you might disprove the Bible. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. We can't, go, we can't be Mormon-esque about this. You know, if you try to disprove the Book of Mormon, anything anybody says, a scientist, a historian, or anthropologist, archaeologist, anybody says anything against the Book of Mormon, your mind is tainted by the devil. Right? Christians should never take that approach. The Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. Well, okay, but don't become an apologist. Because <laughs> that's not apologetics. Apologetics is the marshalling of evidence in favor of a claim. What we're going to do here is take the claim. Sodom and Gomorrah really existed just, and were destroyed just like the Bible says. And we're going to take that claim, we're going to put it to the spade... We're going to take it, put it into the archaeological world. We're going to dig it up. We're going to examine it. We're going to say yay or nay. Maybe the Bible will come out on top. Maybe it won't. Let's see what happens. Now, we go to the book of Genesis. and By the way, the whole Old Testament is what I call a serial geography. The stories are never told. Nothing ever happens. Nobody ever says a peep or does anything unless it's in a designated place. Place is everything in the Old Testament. So, all the stories take us from place to place to place to look at the Exodus itinerary. We go place to place to place to place. Everything takes place along a route at a given location here and there. So, uh, this is very important. Now, the next thing that, over, that scholars overlook, and this is one of the first things that uh, argument that we want with a lot of our liberal friends, this is a fact. Ancient writers didn't make up fictitious geographies. There's no such thing as the five-acre wood or Middle Earth in ancient Near Eastern writing. It doesn't matter whether the stories themselves are fact or fiction. They are layered over a real-world geography. That is just simply a fact. Now, if these stories were written, and I'm talking about the Abrahamic stories of patriarchal narratives, if they were actually written during the Bronze Age, which is the, where the Bible chronology puts them, what we call the Bronze Age, and we'll put some dates to that shortly, 
then this would be what's called the maximalist view. In other words, people who are maximalists believe that the maximal amount of material in the Bible actually happened. But if you believe that these things were written in the late Iron Age, that is sometime after the Babylonian captivity by Judahite priests living in Jerusalem, creating a, creating a fictitious a history for themselves, trying to justify their grab of the land, which is what all the Palestinians believe. Um, but that's the minimalist view. And, but it doesn't matter, does it? Because the minimalist view says that you have Iron Age writers looking at piles of ruins, making up stories as to how those piles of ruins got there. Oh, little, you know, little Ibrahim, uh, your great, great uncle Joshua destroyed that city. See that pile of ruins over there? He did that. So you make up stories to explain the geography around you. Well, uh, that would be the minimalist view. But whether you're a minimalist or a maximalist, the fact is that the stories are told over a real-world geography. That is just simply a fact. Now, if these are... We can get her to move here. There we go. If these are descriptions of living Bronze Age sites, then perhaps these are eyewitness accounts. These are authentic or eyewitness accounts. If they're descriptions of big piles of ruins, then they are what we call uh, etiological. They're geographically authentic, but they're etiological, that they're made-up stories to explain the existence of ruins. So no matter how you slice it, we have a fact-based geography in the Bible, and that includes the cities of the plain, Sodom and Gomorrah. Now... A little bit of exercise here. I know this is going to be um, a little pedantic for some of you. But um, how in the world, look, look at that uninspired section in the back of your Bible. Flip over there. That's with the, all those nice colored maps, if you have maps in the back of your Bible. Pick an Old Testament map. Just look at an Old Testament map. You can probably count at least 40 cities, towns, and villages named on the map. Now, those 40 cities, towns, and villages are there for a reason because what scholars do is they look at the geography of the biblical text and they use the knowns to work to the unknowns and they just do geography and find the locations. Now, that's how they get on the Bible. By the way, in in archaeology, out of the top 40 identified biblical sites that are on the maps, only one of them has ever had a sign excavated that said, welcome to the particular city. Ekron has a sign, welcome to the precincts of Ekron. That's nice. But no other city, not even Jerusalem, has an an excavated, identifiable name of the city. Okay, so how do you identify where they are? Based on the biblical text. So, here are my, I'm not going to give you my geodata top 40, thankfully, only the top 10. Here they are. Now look at this. The the number at the end is how many geographical indicators in the biblical text help us identify that site for placement on a map. That is, it's next to this river, it's near the coast, it's by this mountain, it's north of this city or that other location. In other words, little indicators in the text that tell us geographically where to go. There are the top ten. And these are all on the maps. Notice that Jerusalem sits at the top of this list at number two with 18 geographical indicators in the text. You know what number one is? Thought you'd never ask. And it's not going to give it to me. There it is. Tal Hamam has 25 geo-indicators in the biblical text as to its location. However, how many of you have Sodom and Gomorrah on a Bible map in your Bible without a question mark? Hmm. Bet you have Jerusalem. Okay? But you don't have Sodom. Why? If Sodom has so many geographical indicators, why is it not in the text? Well, I'm going to show you why in a minute. By the way, here are the bottom five. All of these are on the maps. Yarmut, Dotan, Arad, all on the maps. Only three indicators in the text, yet they're on the map. Sodom with 25 isn't on the map. It's very strange. Now, let's go back to the 19th century. Most of the major scholars, the explorer scholars in the 19th century, placed the cities of the plain north of the Dead Sea. The traditional location was always in the south of the Dead Sea. If you see, by the way, every week... 
almost without fail, there's a special on History Channel, Discovery Channel, Nat Geo, about the location of Sodom. And they always go to the south end of the Dead Sea, and they're always wrong. And, um, but all of these explorer scholars in the 19th century put the cities north of the Dead Sea for very good reason, because, and by the way, here's an 1888 Bible map. Look where the cities of the plain are located, north of the Dead Sea. How did they arrive at that location? They got there because they followed the geography of Genesis. They actually, I got a clue for you. If you want to do biblical stuff or you want to do biblical geography, you might want to try reading the text. Hmm? All right. Now, how did most modern scholars wind up with the cities of the plain at the south end of the Dead Sea? I like to just flip it upside down just for fun, just to be mean. Um, How did they arrive at here? They arrived here by completely ignoring the geography of Genesis, as we'll see. They totally ignored it. Now, the culprit here is none other than the most powerful Middle Eastern archaeological scholar of the 20th century, William Foxwell Albright. The Bible scholars loved Albright. I mean, they worship him. In fact, if you go to any Bible dictionary, encyclopedia, Bible commentary today, look up Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain, they'll still be quoting Albright. And what did Albright do? Well, he knew that all of the archaeological sites around the Dead Sea uh, didn't date to the time of Abraham, which he thought to be the Middle Bronze Age, and he was correct on that. But where did he put Sodom and Gomorrah? If he didn't actually put them at any of the cities around the Dead Sea. Where did he put Sodom and Gomorrah? He put them underneath the shallow waters at the, in the Dead Sea South Basin. Well, that's a nice place to put it. Put it somewhere where nobody can go check it out. Can't go dig it up. Uh, however, but since then, it's dried up, as it has historically many times. And uh, guess what? No cities there. Not one shirt of pottery. There's nothing there. Uh, not only that, it's in the wrong place. But that's where he did it. But yet, when Albright said that's where it was, I, most of your Bible dictionaries, commentaries, encyclopedias, you go look it up. They're going to quote Albright. They're going to say, they're underneath the waters of the south end of the Dead Sea. Well, um, he created his own etiological legend is what he did. Why? Why, would he, why would anybody put the... Cities of Sodom and Gomorrah at the south end of the Dead Sea. If it's the wrong place, why would they put it there? Well, frankly, if you go down there and look at it, it looks like a place God would have destroyed by fire. And it just looks toasted. Especially if you go there in the summertime. So, it has held all of these years. Now, um, Now, here's an interesting fact. 100%, not 99%, 100% of all the scholars who have bothered to do a detailed analysis of Genesis 13, 1 through 12, which is the passage, the serial geography passage leading us to Sodom, 100% of scholars who do a detailed analysis of that passage put Sodom and Gomorrah north of the Dead Sea. On the other hand, and they do it by a straightforward reading of the Hebrew text, On the other hand, 100% of scholars who put the cities of the plain toward the south end of the Dead Sea do so by completely ignoring the text of Genesis 13. Not a single one of them ever produced an analysis of that text. They ignore it. And uh, therefore, I think their location of a southern Sodom is just like reading the Hebrew text upside down. It's, It's nonsense. Now, why Genesis 13? Okay, here it is. This is the only passage in Scripture. When, anybody take hermeneutics, right? A little biblical interpretation. Rule one, any subject you're going to investigate in the Bible, you better go to the quintessential, to the definitive passage in Scripture that is specifically written to answer the question or speak to the question. Right? You go to that. Well, in this case, there's only one passage that gives us a specifically written geography purposefully, consciously to take us to the location of Sodom. And that's Genesis 13. Here it is. So, Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev. Lot went with him from the Negev. He went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, 
Lot looked up and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered, like the garden of Yahweh, like the land of Egypt toward Zoar. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now, in this passage, well, uh, the uh, computer has changed our fonts just ever so slightly. There are three words there that mean uh, plain, and we're going to come back. You see there's one on the bottom, the cities of the plain, there's one about in the middle. There are three uses of the word plain in this context. Now, there are four Hebrew words that mean plain. Bika emek mishor arva. And this word used for plain in Genesis, in the cities of the plain stories, is not one of these. In fact, this word is not even a geographical term at all, even though it's translated in most translations, plain or valley. Now, again, uh, it's not going to be there, but... I would have three words plain pointing to this. The, three, the, the words translated plain 13 times through the, through the Old Testament, uh, 10 of them in, in Genesis, is the word kikar. Cities of the plain is cities of the kikar. The plain of the Jordan. The kikar of the Jordan. Okay? Now what does kikar mean? It means a talent of metal, a flat circular disc of metal. It's a weight would look kind of like a discus, I guess. Or it means a flat circular loaf of bread, which every culture has. And in New Mexico, we just like to eat tortillas. So you probably eat those up here. Lavash. Okay. Any flat circular bread, right? So I always say, talent or tortilla, that's what it means. So... Uh, by the way, it's found in all the Near Eastern languages, in Akkadian, in Ugaritic, in Egyptian. Uh, Egyptian actually means also to draw a circle in the sand with a stick. So the idea is a circle. Now, the reason they use the word kikar, remember it's not a geographical term, why do they use it? Because geographical area looks like this. We say boot heel of Italy. Why? Because it looks like a boot heel. This looks like a tortilla, therefore they call it the tortilla. Now, um, here it is. Oh, yeah. It's cities of the Kikar. It's the plain of the Jordan, the Kikar of the Jordan. Very important to remember. Now, here it is. Here's the north end of the Dead Sea. Here's the Jordan River Valley coming down. It widens out into a large circular area, the alluvial plain north of the Dead Sea. Here it is. This is the Kikar, the disk. And it's north of the Jordan because, number one, Ha Yardin never, ever refers to anything other than the Jordan River proper. Never. Just the Jordan. And... Hayardin never includes any part of the Valley of Sidim, the Valley of Salt, the Sea of the Arabah, the Dead Sea. Never, ever. In fact, the Bible says very clearly that they are two separate water systems. The Hayardin is a system of living water. The Dead Sea is a dead salt basin. And uh, they are never confused. Now, here's the Dead Sea area. Here's the Kikar. Here's the mouth of the Jordan. Five passages in the Old Testament say the Jordan ends at the mouth of the Jordan at the Bay of the Dead Sea below Pisgah. Look where Pisgah is. There it is. That's the extent of the Jordan. So therefore, the Jordan cannot go further south than the north end of the Dead Sea. It, the text also says that it's watered like the Garden of Yahweh. How's Egypt watered? Do you remember? I mean, sorry, how's Eden watered? A river runs through it. It breaks into four channels when it leaves the garden, but a river runs through it. Uh, it says also it's watered like Egypt. I think it's kind of, well, if you can back that up, do it. Um, it's watered like Egypt because how's, the Egypt, how's Egypt watered? The Nile runs through it, but what happens to the Nile every year? Once a year, it fl overfloods its banks. They plant behind the receding waters and the water-laden silt. They do the exact same thing in antiquity in the Jordan. The Jordan is a Nile in miniature in every way. 
And of course, Moses writing this or collating this material together would certainly know that hanging out in this area. So, uh, very important. So, how well watered is the area uh, just north of the Dead Sea? It's very well watered. It's the best watered agriscape in the region. I'm drawing in the their perennial rivers coming in from uh, the Jordan side into the uh, into the uh, Jordan River, and but not from the Israel side. But this is the, and the stars represent springs, okay? This is the best watered agriscape in the region. Not only that, it's from 400 to 1,200 feet below sea level. You can grow crops all year round. When it's snowing in Jerusalem, snowing up in Amman, it's cold up on the plateaus, down in the valley. It's very, very warm. They grow bananas there today uh, because it's subtropical. And so you, you never have a problem. You can grow all the time. It's the best watered agricultural land in the region. Now, the Bible says Lot could view the entire, and even uses the Hebrew word coal, the entire disc, kikar, from Bethel and I. What scholars... I always say, if you don't learn to ask the right question, you will probably never get the right answers, right? The operative question here for locating Sodom is, where was Lot standing when he lifted up his eyes and saw the whole circle of the Jordan Valley? Well, the Bible tells us they had gone to Bethel and I. From Bethel and I, he looked over and saw. Now, what did he see? Now, here's Bethel and I. I worked with a team that excavated uh, I for six years uh, back in the 90s. And uh, so we know what you can, can and cannot see from this area. You cannot see toward Babadra and Numira, the traditional Sodom and Gomorrah toward the south. That's your History Channel, Discovery Channel, Sodom and Gomorrah down there. Um, but you can't see those from here, but you can see that. And that's all you can see is the whole circle of the Jordan from that location. Not only that, but it says from Bethel and I, Lot traveled eastward towards Sodom. There's, again, Bethel and I, that's east. He traveled in that direction, pitched his tent as far as Sodom. End of discussion. The geography is easy. It's a slam dunk. Why people missed it uh, in the 20th century uh, is beyond me, except for the power of W.F. Albright. The 19th century scholars had it right. We should have kept listening to them. Now, Lot went that direction, therefore uh, the cities of the plain can only be in that location. They cannot be in the Dead Sea area. It's impossible. Now, um, that's the geography. Now, this was the theoretical map 10 years ago when we first started doing this research, based on the text, this is the map we came up with. I can't go into all the other reasoning behind it because there's some Egyptian literature that plays in, there's a few other things, but... Um, this is the way the map configures. This is where Sodom and Gomorrah ought to be. And if you go to this location and you don't find Middle Bronze Age cities dating to the time of Abraham that were destroyed, and by the way, Moses came to the same area before he crossed over to Jordan and nobody was home, which means in the time of Moses, the whole area has to be abandoned. It's very difficult when you have the best watered agricultural land in the region. For When a city gets destroyed, they usually rebuild it because they build them for location, location, location. And when you have a city that's destroyed and it doesn't show up, they don't get rebuilt for hundreds of years, it would be very strange. <laughs> but you have to have that, or you don't have Sodom. You don't have the right area. So uh, here are the cities. That's where they should be. If we, we were taking a risk now, because if we went there and the cities did not exist, then we have a real problem. We got some splaining to do, Lucy. <laughs> but I'm sneaky. I had an out. My out was that in my research on the destruction language of the city, it would the, the Hebrew language of destruction would accommodate anything from a garden variety fire to molecular disintegration or anything in between. So we could go there and we could say, well, this is where they were. Before God just disintegrated them right down to the atomic level, right? Just gone. That wouldn't have been too good of an explanation for the scientists, however, I don't think. Um, 
So here it is. I want to move through these as quickly as I can. Hmm. What you're looking at right now are the actual Bronze Age archaeological sites on the Eastern Jordan disk. Whoops. We went not knowing there were any there, and once we actually got on the ground and began to do our research and explore the area, we wound up with more than we needed. So now it was a process of elimination. Which ones are the cities of the plain actually mentioned in the Bible? By the way, why is there only one city at the junction on the west side, Jericho, and on all the archaeological literature up to this point, there's absolutely nothing at that big, huge intersection on the other side of the river. Nothing. You can't find any of those cities on any of the research. Oh, they're all there if you dig into the little local reports and into surveys and so on, but uh, difficult to get to, but they're there. But there's one big one sitting there without a name. Let's put a name to it. It's Tal El Hamam. Why did we say that, that it might be the city of Sodom itself? Simply because uh, of its size. The writer assumes that Sodom is the biggest city on the Eastern Jordan disk because it's always listed first. It's the only one ever mentioned by itself. And King Bera of Sodom is the only one that has a voice in the story. In fact, he actually hangs out with Abram, goes up to hang out with Melchizedek and so on. So, uh, Sodom is the biggest city on the Eastern Jordan disk. Well, if you're going to look for Sodom, and the Bible says Sodom is the biggest city on the Eastern Jordan disk, I suppose you ought to go to the Eastern Jordan disk and find the biggest Bronze Age city. And here she is. She's not only the biggest, she's bigger than Jerusalem and Jericho by a magnitude of 10. Okay, she makes, she makes Bronze Age Jerusalem look like a pimple, and Jericho as well. Jericho... That famous Jericho is about 12 acres. Tal Hamam is 36 hectares, 80 acres inside the city wall. Uh, so it's huge by Bronze Age standards. Now, how did we miss it? Here it is from the sky. It is the burial ship, the burial place of the Starship Enterprise, <laughs> as you can see. Uh, just kidding about that. But um, you can find it in Google. If you look northeast of the Dead Sea, look for that, and you'll find it really easy because it stands out like a sore thumb. Um, here's from Mount Nebo. You can see that, again, it's really easy to see. I've kind of enhanced it there. Here's the lower tell. This is, uh, this is, I have to show this because my surveyor likes to play with this stuff, and he says, oh, look what I did. Okay, so he gives me all these colors. Really, it's really not that color, uh, but he likes to do that. Um, but that's it. We have an upper, so you can see an upper city and a lower city uh, in that. Now here, these are, these are all the features within a kilometer. We have rivers, perennial rivers. We have our site footprint. We have the urban footprint itself. We have uh, lands that are used for agriculture. We have the, the orange areas, which are our cave and shaft tombs, and all the rest are dolmen fields. These are megalith monuments, stone alignments, you know, kind of stone hingey type stuff. Uh, that are all used by our, our site. Now, that's the geography. But the story of Abraham belongs to the Middle Bronze Age, and it's not enough to do geography. you got to do chronology. So here it is. The biblical date for Abram, Abraham and Lot, belong to the Middle Bronze Age. Whether you take an early date for the Exodus, late date for the Exodus, and do all your configuring, Abraham still winds up in the Middle Bronze Age. Some people take a much later date, but it's not likely. Um, and this would also mean that Genesis 10, which pushes the story back well before the time of Abraham, would give us uh, Sodom in what we might call the early Bronze Age. And so go back before the time of Abraham. Abraham and Lot are there. The Genesis uh, 10 passage would take us to the cities of the plain back to the early Bronze Age. And so if we're going to find Sodom, it's got to give us the early Bronze Age. It's got to give us probably the intermediate between, but certainly the Middle Bronze Age. And if we don't have that chronology, we don't have Sodom. All right. So this is the proper time frame for biblical Sodom. And that's what we're stuck with. And we can't waffle on that because the biblical text is very specific. Now, here she is. <clears throat> we have the early Bronze Age. The same footprint has the intermediate Bronze Age and the same footprint holds the Middle Bronze Age city. There's also a much later city built during the Iron Age, 
But the separation between the Bronze Age city and the Iron Age city that's built later is seven centuries, five to seven centuries. It's not just Tal al-Hammam. Every single archaeological site in the area on the disk was destroyed toward the end of the Middle Bronze Age, mysteriously, and did not regain any kind of occupation until five to seven centuries later. That's very odd, given it's the best watered agricultural land in the region. Now, this just gives you an idea of the occupation. We go all the way back, actually, to the Chalcolithic period, and we have this massive gap right in the center of it. This is the beating heart, the smoking gun uh, for the location of Sodom. What does it look like? We have a wonderful um, fortifications around the lower city, but also uh, that same fortification is used in the, uh, in the later periods. And then, by the way, the, the yellow part there uh, is the part that we've actually excavated. Here's the Bronze Age city during the time of Abraham, a massive 100-foot thick fortification running around it. We know now where the temple is. We know where the palace is, what we think is the palace of King Bera, and there you go. In the Iron Age, of course, the city is much, much smaller. Trying to keep track of our time here. Now, Here's our Bronze Age stratum. This is on the upper tail. We dig through uh, about nine feet of uh, Iron Age material, and you go, and then you immediately jump back six, seven hundred years to the Middle Bronze Age. That Middle Bronze Age stratum on the upper tail is sitting in a meter of ugly ash and destruction debris. It is a massive, massive destruction. I could tell stories about that, but I've got one to tell a little bit later. The one I was going to tell was funny. I don't have time to be funny. <laughs> they did have a very sulfury stench uh, in, that, uh, in that layer of ash. And everybody, when they first excavated into it that morning, were all looking around at each other, wondering what everybody else had for breakfast. Middle Bronze Age storage jars, piriform juglets that are distinctive of the Middle Bronze Age period, coming out of the site pretty routinely now. Um, Tal Hammam was continuously occupied from at least the Chalcolithic period all the way to its destruction in MB2. What does this mean if Tal Hammam is biblical Sodom? It means that the city lasted over 2,500 years, unbroken occupation. It's never, we don't think it was ever beaten in battle. It certainly uh, didn't have a day when nobody lived there. Continuous occupation, same clan, same families living there for 2,500 years before God destroyed it. How long has America been around? I always talk to my, my American friends and go, you know, how long have we been around, folks? Yeah. And we're already about to the line, I think. <laughs> okay? So I always tell folks... All of us in Western civilization, where we are today, what we've done, thumbing our nose at God, took 2,500 years for Sodom to tick God off. So let's not get cocky. Um, I'm gonna, this will be thoroughly boring to some of you. I'm just going to let this play. This is, this is what re results from excavating a square. We wind up with nice cuts on the balks, and here you see I'm just coloring in the various things. This is engineered fill. Uh, we're coming up to uh, the building of the first foundation of the early bronze city wall, the street that's outside of it. That street was continuously then used in the early bronze three, all the way down to the time of Abraham when they built this massive fortification. This is engineered fill going in. They're just piling anything and everything in there to fill the gaps. And then they build a massive mud brick structure over the top. Uh, that fortification runs around the entire city for almost two kilometers, and it's 100 feet thick. Um, these are our dolmens we're talking about. And uh, these are actually ritual monuments. They're not burials. Um, if you come and excavate with us, and we had over 100 volunteers on the site this year, one of the drawings of our dolmens, if you come to the site, we guarantee you dig with us, you'll find cool stuff or your money back. And uh, these are our volunteer diggers. This is what they do. This is, kind of, this is all from one single dolmen chamber. 
and uh, 2,000 years of pottery. I was just kidding about the money back thing. (laughs) But you will have a lot of fun. It's a great vacation. We stay at a five-star resort hotel. Not intense, and uh, the resort hotel is actually a sponsor of the dig, and we get fantastic rates. If you're retired and you want a fabulous vacation, fabulous, you will love it. You will help uncover history. And every year we get folks from all over the world. Five continents this year were represented, and uh, it's a lot of fun. The city of Sodom was fortified. It's not just got to be in the right time. It's not just got to be in the right place. It's got to have the right stuff. And part of the right stuff is a fortification. It's got to be fortified. So, is it fortified? Here's my wife and I standing atop the 36-degree sloping rampart from the upper city. Here's the lower city fortifications, a 6-meter thick. I put 5.2, but it's actually now we've measured it in most places to 6-meter thick early bronze city wall. The middle bronze city wall is inside of that, but it's not just the city wall in the middle bronze age. Uh, it's something else. That's Lane Rittmeyer's reconstruction of, uh, of our early gate system. But here's the way the structure looks. It's pretty amazing if we can get the thing to work. There we go. Um, we have stone stabilizer walls going down the hill that uh, hold the mud bricks in place. And uh, actually that entire thing uh, comes out to be about 100 feet thick. And in this particular area, we have a preservation rate from that point to that point, a preservation rate of about 40%. We're working on a new one this last season that has about a 70% preservation. Absolutely fantastic. Um, So archaeologically and geographically, the biggest fortified city on the Eastern Jordan disc would be at least a most likely candidate for biblical Sodom. I think it's gone way beyond that by now. It spreads out over a square kilometer. It's the largest Bronze Age city in the southern Levant. It's a powerful city-state now with many towns and villages, and it has all of the gap that we need for the biblical story to be true. Fact. Bronze Age civilization on the eastern Jordan disc with Tal Hammam as its cultural center flourished for over 2,000 years. Another fact. The Bronze Age civilization there, including Tal Hammam, came to a screeching halt toward the end of the Middle Bronze Age during the time of Abraham, and the whole area remained unoccupied for several centuries thereafter. Here's the critical question. Why did the best watered agricultural land in the region remain without cities and towns for the ensuing five to seven centuries after its destruction? There's only one answer to that question. And that's the biblical story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's all exactly as the Bible describes. Here's the destruction layer in the Bronze Age. There is the Iron Age stuff over the top on the upper tail. And we have this gap between. It appears everywhere we dig. Here's the top of the middle Bronze Age rampart. You can even see some of the mud bricks. We can get them in there. And there's the footer for the Iron Age We've excavated away the Iron Age wall, but let's put it back. But there's the gap between the two again. Now, here are the sites with this, with this gap profile. Actually, there's a whole lot more, but these are the main ones. They follow the exact same configuration that we put in our theoretical map. And there was a reason for that, because the biblical text is a description of that. Why wouldn't it match? Now... We satisfy every Sodom criterion in the biblical text. But what about the southern sites? Let's get rid of them. Could they be Sodom and Gomorrah? Here they are. Babadra and Numera. Okay, here they are. Here's Babadra. Just looks like the well-watered plain of the Jordan, doesn't it? Here's Babadra. It was destroyed in 2350, continued on down to 2200. Both of those dates are hundreds of years before Abraham and Lot were ever born. So it strikes out in both categories. Here's Numera. It was founded after 2800 BC, finally destroyed in 2600 BC. But here's the problem with this site. Here's Abraham and Lot. Here's Baba Dra. Here's Numera. They're not even destroyed at the same time. How does that fit the story of Sodom and Gomorrah that we're just... Supposedly destroyed at the same time. Doesn't even fit. So, 
Could they be Sodom and Gomorrah? No, because they are in absolutely the wrong place and they are in the wrong time. In archaeology, two strikes, you're out. <laughs> okay. All right. So the Sodom narrative marks out a location for the cities of the Kikar north of the Dead Sea and east of the Jordan River where, in fact, the ruins of great Bronze Age cities do exist. That agreement between text and ground cannot be a mere coincidence. All right? Here they are. They're in the right place. They are in the right time frame. And they have all the right stuff. Now, everybody wants to talk about terms of destruction. I don't know why we're kind of perverse that way, I guess. Um, it got, it, this has always been a fun part of the presentation until this last excavation season. We just got home. And uh, this season, for the first time, we found dead people in the terminal destruction layer. Not a few. And not just adults. It's very dramatic, very heart wrenching. It was very, in fact, it was, those were very quiet days in that sector of the excavation uh, because I had my two expert osteologists on the site uh, calling the shots, so to speak, of the excavation of, those, of that skeletal material, and they're describing every joint, every phenomenon going on with the bones uh, from a physiological point of view. These bodies are ripped and torn and the bodies that are whole are laying among, amongst a slurry of body parts from other people. Uh, well, let's, let's look at it. Uh, remember, I already said we have the ash and destruction debris. We have some mud bricks. By the way, they didn't build with fired mud brick. They built with sun-dried mud brick. But some of our bricks have been heated to such high temperatures that they ring like porcelain when you hit them with a trowel. Some of our roofing material is burned as if it were pottery. It's just like it's in a kiln. This is wattle and daub from a roof, but it's been burned severely. Right here in the Middle Bronze Age II stratum from the time of Abraham, nine feet down in the excavation of the upper tell, we found this. This is a shirt of pottery. This is an anomaly right now. We don't have another one. We just have this one, but it's really strange. Uh, it is the shoulder of a large Middle Bronze Age storage jar. This is the other side of it. The surface of it has been heated to such a high temperature instantly that the surface melted into glass, but the glass did not even flow over the edge of the break more than one millimeter. It cooled as fast as it was heated. We had this thing analyzed for 12 hours by the USGS at a laboratory in New Mexico. And... Um, in an electron probe microanalyzer, a glorified electron microscope that can tell you all the ins and outs of all the molecular stuff that's going on. The zircons, I'll just say this about it, the zircons in the center of this quarter inch thick piece of pottery, in the center of the, of the section, away from the burn on the surface, away from the melted glass on the surface, those zircons were turned into bubbles at over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You can't do that in a kiln. You can't do that in a burning room. And ancient people of this time don't glaze their pottery. Glazed pottery doesn't come around until about, about the 6th, 7th century AD. Okay? Now, I want you to be very careful right here. I don't, I want you to hear what I, I don't want you to hear what I'm not saying. That's the pottery shirt from the Middle Bronze Age. It is chemically, according to the scientific analysis, it is, it is chemically, structurally, materially, in every way identical to this. That material is trinitite, ground zero of the explosion of the first atomic bomb, Trinity site near Alamogordo, New Mexico. They are identical. In fact, when we handed the shirt to the, to the USGS geologists that did the examination, the first thing they said to me was, nice piece of trinitite. I said, flip it over. Oh, it's pottery. Where did you get this? Never mind. Just do the test. 
They still don't know where it came from, and we still haven't published this. Um, it's only one of, the, one of the many cards in the deck that are stacking up. But we do have this. And by the way, don't run out of here and say, Dr. Collins said God destroyed Sodom with an atom bomb. <laughs> I've had people do that to me. Don't do that to me. I'm not saying that. All we're saying is whatever this airburst was out of the heavens that fried the cities of the Kikar, the heat index was hot enough to produce some pretty strange stuff. This is desert glass. For those of you who are up on Tunguska, Siberia, 1908, didn't have any of this, but airbursts like that often produce uh, desert glass when they're over sandy areas. And we have some of this around our site as well. Uh, it, is, it is not produced, this cannot be produced ge geologically. It is only produced by cosmic impact. All right. Um, bones. This was the first season in the Middle Bronze Age in the destruction layer of Tal al -Hamam. Bones of people. Here's a femur, but look at this bone scatter. Ribs. Pieces of long bones, ends of long bones. This is our conservator. She's the conservator of the Tandy Museum, Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth. Preserving the bones. Notice a couple things. Notice the hyperflexed toes. This is not normal. This person is on his face. His knees are twisted 30 degrees from normal. The top, the top of his, his femur just above his knees are charred off and broken. That's how they came in C2. They're completely pulled off and broken out of, out of socket. And not only that, but you continue to see the bone, extra bone scatter, ribs and other body parts. Uh, we had children as well. It was really, really dramatic. It is. We were so careful when we did this. I mean, we went down so carefully to make sure that there wasn't any cut through everything. These people were laying under mud bricks, under ash and destruction debris. They were not placed there. They were buried by it. They were thrown down directionally. They're all going the same direction on their faces, twisted on their sides. Uh, very violent. Instant, however. Um, some of the potty, pottery from the destruction layer of Sodom. This is the terminal destruction. This is the sacred precinct. Here is the part of the city wall, and this is where some of the skeletons are coming from. This is domestic. These are houses. Now, I'm just going to do something really quick here. God had Moses come to this same place. All, by the way, all scholars agree. It's in all the literature, everything you want to read about it. Abel Shittim, where Moses camped the Israelites before they crossed the river over to Jericho, is already identified as Tal al Hamam. I didn't do that. Other scholars did that. I happen to agree with it. This is where Moses camped the Israelites. That's where Moses put his command encampment. If you're a, if you're a military guy, that's where you put your command camp up, where you have a 360 of everything. He would put his Levitical encampment down there on the uh, saucer section of the Enterprise, down there at the bottom of the lower section, and the Israelite encampments would go around it. This is, remember he said they camped opposite Jericho. We are spot on east of Jericho. Jericho and Tal Hamam are exactly the same elevation and exactly east and west from one another. Now, that's where that little yellow spot right there is where the Ark of the Covenant would be sitting in the tabernacle. What we're excavating at that place right there is the Canaanite temple of Sodom. This is where all the ritual uh, uh, fertility religion uh, was going on with the, with the Sodomites here with its probably typical cult, male and female cult prostitutes, the worship going on right here. This is ground zero of evil, God's destruction to the city. What did God do? choose. If this is where he put the tabernacle, and there's, by the way, there's, we've really studied it. There's no other place where this whole thing would work in this whole area. If God put the ark there, that's the most holy object in the universe, representing the very presence of God, sitting at ground zero of evil. Is God cool or what? 
Is he, a, is he a restorer or what? Is he a redeemer or what? Because that's exactly what he did to your heart. When you ask Christ to come into your life, he put his Holy Spirit in your heart, ground zero of evil, and he cleansed it. I think it was the Israelites who camped here that got the ball rolling again with the folks beginning to move back into the area. Ooh, God didn't kill them. Maybe we can start farming there. And eventually they began to build cities a few centuries later. Now, here's what I say, Mr. Deaver. The Bible and the trowel do work quite well together. And if you guys, you other scholars, had bothered to take the Bible seriously to locate Sodom and Gomorrah, you would have been excavating these cities a long time ago and they would have already been in the archaeological literature. You didn't, they aren't. We found them, now they are. Thank you.